Well, that was beautiful, Princess Dina. And I want to congratulate you and thank you for accepting this award. It's uh, people like you that have given so many that don't have a voice the opportunity to actually be sought out and be seen. And again, because of your voice, you have really given so many so much and you continue to do so. So I'd like to thank you again very much uh, from the bottom of my heart for doing everything that you have done. And again, for accepting this award. And with that, I'd like to turn over to uh, Dr. Gassan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks so much for being with us. And uh, Her Highness uh, Princess Nina, congratulations wholeheartedly. Uh, as we just spoke, uh, it has been a year since we met in Nur Sultan. I would have loved to be in Muscat this year, but we're greatly honored even virtually to welcome you to the C3 and to Sloan Catering and congratulations again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then Carol, I know that you've already given a lovely tribute, but if you'd like to say a couple live words, please go ahead. Five words. Well, I'm honoured to have known Princess Dina and seen her work, as I mentioned before, firsthand at the United Nations during the MCD summits. And her support and her drive and her advocacy were critical to engaging people both locally and internationally. So thank you so much and for being such an inspiration, um, especially to women as well around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so honored to have received this very special award from your esteemed organization at the 10th annual anniversary of C3 US Arab Healthcare and Business Summit. Thank you all, Ransel, Dr. Hassan, Carmel, and all of you um, on this meeting very much from the bottom of my heart for this special recognition. The focus of this event cannot be more timely. Transitioning of global healthcare and education to innovation and technology. This transitioning, which was already taking place, has accelerated drastically with the coronavirus pandemic. The fact that this event is taking place at all virtually is one example of the rapid transition to digital technology. How is that changing the landscape for health and cancer specifically? Healthcare systems are experiencing extreme pressures due to the coronavirus pandemic. Medical resources and staff being diverted to respond to the crisis. Lockdowns and quarantine are restricting access to cancer care, e.g. treatments delayed, cancer screening services canceled, and so on. And reports are also emerging of disruptions to drug and equipment supply chains. Clinical trials and research projects are on hold. Conferences are being postponed. And many cancer organizations are facing, facing, facing up the facing up impact of the crisis. Tragically, the reduction and delay in cancer care is expected to arise in cancer incidence and mortality in the near future. On the positive side, hospitals, support groups, and other organizations have been adapting and responding to such a challenging environment by establishing, for example, virtual support groups uh, via WhatsApp, Zoom, Facebook, utilizing telemedicine for training and education, outreach to patients who may have trouble accessing or understanding how to use digital tools or establishing virtual fundraising, such as using exercise phone apps to replace in-person walkathons and many more. I know that many of the sessions at the C3 Summit um, will be taking an informed look at these innovations and how they are impacting healthcare provision. If there's one thing that COVID-19 has shown us was the reminder that health and medicine is not quote unquote, a doctor with a black bag. After all, it's a complex web of systems and processes. It is actually a healthcare delivery system, as quoted by Professor Siddhartha Mukherjee. The fact that measly 50 cent protective masks became a crucial obstacle in the fight against COVID-19 reminded us all that health is indeed as, is as much about supply chains as about 
expensive equipment and medications. We saw the surprising and varying responses to the pandemic by countries as well. Countries who had a less sophisticated technological health system had actually fared better in their fight against COVID-19 than others. Thailand, as an example, touted as one of the top countries with an impactful response. Why? Thailand had long established the infrastructure of community health workers. These workers were trained and more importantly had the trust of their community. Once the pandemic hit, they were quickly mobilized. Then through the use of simple low-tech mobile applications, the health workers were given information on preventative measures, including safety of this technology, could not have succeeded without an already existing system in place for health delivery. This is not to say that new technology and innovation do not have great value on global healthcare. On the contrary, the potential for positive disruption on healthcare is huge. There are promising developments in the last five years alone. We have witnessed remarkable advancements in technological innovations, including mobile phones, tablets, remote patient monitoring devices and sensors that drive the so-called digital health around the world. E-health based on information communication technology, ICT, is being used by programs not only in high-income countries, but also in low- and middle-income countries that seek to improve private sector health financing and delivery. Telemedicine, for example, allows for centralization of expertise with unlimited geographical reach to coach frontline health workers and guide them through their patient care. And with e-learning, many more health workers can benefit from the latest updates and refresher courses, whether pre or in-service training. In addition, digital technology offers the incredible opportunity to engage patients in the management of their own health, empowering them through targeted messaging and health information. It also allows the use of real-time health data so that health surveillance systems can become more action-oriented and detect emerging crises in time to organize a proper response. Innovation and technology are necessary to better healthcare and education, and particularly essential to providing more effective prevention tools and treatment options for health and cancer that will reduce the number of deaths. However, technology and innovation can only deliver if implemented with care and cautious and in, and in context of an integrated system. For one, the infrastructure that optimizes patient outcome of the healthcare delivery system has to be in place first. One cannot just plonk technology on a fragmented health system and expect it to do miracles. It is not a magic silver bullet. It is but one tool in a big toolbox. Digital health has to be part and parcel of the full health intervention package and needs to be thoroughly integrated into health systems. Innovation in healthcare delivery has to precede the delivery of technology. The King Hussein Cancer Center, KHCC, is a clear example of this. When we first took over the management and governance of our hospital in 2002, 2002 we had the building. We had the latest state-of-the-art medical equipment. And yet, the hospital could not deliver life-saving treatment. It was only when we focused on fine-tuning the existing inefficient systems and processes and correct them to fit and optimize the reality of the patient's needs, including the governance structure of our organization that we were then able to move forward to now become one of the best comprehensive cancer centers in the world, saving thousands of lives, not only in Jordan, but from the region as well. In health, innovation is so much more than the discovery or launching of new apps or expensive technology. It is first and foremost about finding better ways of reaching people to improve the efficiency, quality, sustainability, or affordability of healthcare and disease prevention. It has to support, most importantly, equitable access to healthcare and not be just for the privileged few. 
Many advanced technologies are too expensive for low middle income countries and thus will have little effect on alleviating the health crisis for billions around the world for whom advanced high-tech healthcare is simply out of reach. Unfortunately, some low middle income countries, despite the cost, fall into the exaggerated hype of what technology can do alone. And so if they invest their scarce resources in an expensive innovation and technology without performing the due diligence required. For example, they do not follow the ABCs of business practices, such as market research, for example, testing the impact of such technology, performing focus groups to understand the dynamics of such technology with the intended target, i.e. the customer or the patient. Forgetting the impact of culture and stigma, which at times can put a halt to any innovation, however uh, complex and fantastic. The movement against vaccines is one such example. Also, they do not perform the all important function of monitoring and evaluation of that particular technology. Furthermore, such countries also can sometimes fall in the trap of focusing always on high cost solutions, when in actual fact, low cost technological solutions that already exist can be utilized effectively. A stark example of this would be the fight against malaria narrative. Treatment of malaria is very costly and burdensome, burdensome to many Ministry of Health budgets in low and middle income countries. Countries who focus on the prevention side through the use of inexpensive anti-mosquito nets save millions of dollars of having to treat malaria patients. It is important to remember to leverage low cost existing technology and innovation, not only on treatment, but also on prevention. So as to maximize impact and cost efficiency on health delivery. After all, investing $1 on WHO best buys on non-communicable disease prevention and control, for example, gives you a return of $7 per person per year in saved treatment costs. In addition, Global Health has for some time focused on diseases as opposed to patient-centered approach with a clear bias on communicable over non-communicable diseases. This affected many in low middle income countries and resulted in the establishment of inefficient vertical systems, vertical health systems that literally don't talk to each other. Therefore, it is very crucial that policymakers align new technology and innovation with interoperability of open source systems to have that in mind that, that, that can connect and talk to each other. So that, for example, a health worker visiting let's say a patient with COVID-19 symptoms, finds a pregnant diabetic woman. This should activate multi-responses from maternal health, NCD departments, communicable disease departments, simultaneously. We must also be careful that these technological innovations do not further exacerbate the inequities between the rich and poor particularly low and medical, mid, middle income countries where high speed connectivity and higher education is sorely lacking. This can impact the achievement of the 2030 agenda. Innovation and technology should help close rather than widen the gap in the equal access to healthcare that exists between low middle income countries and developed countries and sometimes even within countries. If we can move forward with this guidance in mind, the potential of digital health technology to enable improved healthcare coverage, equity, and quality of care means that our ambitions can be bolder and bigger than ever before. I want to thank you all so much, and I'm holding, I forgot to hold my special award. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's very special, it's gonna have a special place on my sh shelf. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to speak to you all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Princess. Thank Tisha. you. It was a beautiful speech, and uh, you are a beautiful person, and thank you very much for all that you have done for, again, everyone. And again, uh, thank you, all. Thank you so much. Thank you.